by chapter, verse by verse, study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get back into our Father's Word. How great it is. You don't never fail to read the instructions that our Father sent along with these flesh bodies. Tells you how to stay out of trouble. Tells you how to be successful at whatever you're doing. I don't care if it's farming or a professional business. It's all here. He tells you how to be successful if you listen. That's the, that's the major step. Do it his way, not man's way. And you will always, uh, though you may have a few problems, it'll be like walking through the lilies for you, just nothing to it, because he will help you. Do it his way. We thank him for that. We're, we're here we are in chapter 12, verse 37. He had just made this statement, yet a little while longer and the light's going to be with you, so walk in that light. Now, we will learn in the 14th chapter that he has kept that light with us always. That's the best advice he could ever give you. That advice is true to this day. Don't, do not walk in darkness, stay in his light. Though it may be super simple to you, it means you're not quite getting to the depth of it. So hang tough and stay in the light. He's with us always. That is his promise. Okay, that having been said, let's pick it up in chapter 12, verse 37. Let's go with it, with that word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua's precious name. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. He had fed multitudes. He had raised Lazarus from the dead. He had healed one with leprosy. This meant nothing to them. So, you see, many people think if they can perform exciting things that it would cause people to believe. That's not true. Only the Word, when it calls, um, when it comes to remembrance in the mind of each individual, as it is written in the fourth chapter of Revelation, it's there. You just have to kind of call it to remembrance. It clicks. That's what causes people to believe, is the action of the Holy Spirit and the effort put forth by the individual. Verse 38, why? That the saying of Isaiah, or Isaiah the prophet, uh, might be fulfilled, which he spake, O Lord, who hath believed our report? Question. And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? And he's quoting here, where was this written? Isaiah 53, 1, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, uh, where, you know, written long ago that he would be delivered up for us, that he would receive the stripes and we would receive the healing. That means the healing of the mind into clarity, healing of the mind into truth. If you stay in the light, that's what's important. Many times the dark may seem more exciting for the moment. That is to say, anything that is unknown to you causes confusion. But stay in the simplicity of the teachings of Jesus Christ in that light and then take the light with you and push the darkness back and see the depth. Verse 39, therefore, they could not believe because that Isaiah says again, said again, verse 40, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart, that's to say their mind, and be converted and I should heal them. And of course, he's quoting here from Isaiah 6, verses 9 and 10, but... Some might think, that really sounds cruel to me, that God would actually blind some people whereby they might not see the truth. And that might be difficult to understand if you were not aware of the generation of the fig tree and being familiar with the unpardonable sin. 
Because if one knows the truth and uh, would commit the unforgivable sin, which is to say, dip over into the darkness, either in ignorance or knowingly, then it's unforgivable. God sent the Son to this world not to destroy souls or lose them, especially because of the unforgivable sin, but to save them. Why? He loves you. So what this does is creates a cloak of innocency in as much as they don't know. It is not meant that all should know. As it is written in the book of Luke, that if you understand the parable of the sower, probably you have eyes to see and ears to hear. For others, it is impossible, and without understanding the parable of the sower, you're not going to understand any of the parables to their depth. That's just the way it is. And his blindness placed upon them, what I'm trying to say is he placed there in love, not to uh, short anyone or take advantage of anyone. It's just like you, if you have two children and you know that, or you have four children and you know that two of them are real sharp and the other two are a little slow to catch on, you protect the slower. And you expect more from the sharp one. It's just that way. And um, our father is no different. Verse 41. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. Uh, when Isaiah knew the glory would be God's kingdom on earth with all those having been saved that it was possible to save. Verse 42. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, excommunicated. Listen, if holding to the Lord Jesus Christ causes you to be tossed out of a church, hey, goodbye church, good riddance. It wasn't a church you should have been in the first place. Sometimes excommunicate, to be excommunicated could be the best thing that ever happened to you. If you're not being fed properly, if you're not being cared for, if you're not, if you're not experiencing a constant growth in the Word, then you should leave. Because God's Word is pregnant, and it does grow. And each time, I know I'll use myself as an example, which I don't choose to do too often. I've, I don't know how many times I've taught this book of John chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Uh, I really could not count them. I don't know. It would, it would be many, many times. And I still learn something new each time I go through it. Because, again, the Word is pregnant. And you must always be open-minded to that, open-minded to that fact, or you're going to lose out, period. Okay? So, they... Um, Naturally, we know there was Josephus, Nicodemus, many of them in the um, Sanhedrin, and, um, and worked right up with the higher rulers. They believed. They were believers. And later, they would come. Joseph would even, Joseph of Arimathea would even claim the body um, at, uh, the, after the crucifixion. But at this time, it would be very unpopular in the higher echelons of the church to say, it could be him. Okay, verse 43. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Don't ever fall into that category. You really shouldn't worry too much about what men think. Because if you do, you're caught in a snare. Please your father... And that will please all the people that you're supposed to please. And for the others, it isn't time anyway. I know that could be misunderstood by some. Love everyone, but at the same time, never bend the truth to please man, or God will shut you off from the truth. You must always have that, 
that line drawn in the sand, if you would, when you have studied and have committed yourself and you come to that point, you don't bend that. You stand for it. And you're, you're not one of these that's neither hot or cold that God spews out of his mouth. You're a can-do, will-do servant of the living God, and you get it done, all right? Verse 44, Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, now listen carefully, he that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. Naturally, meaning the Father. Listen again very carefully, 45. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. I want you to hang on to that thought real good from here through the 14th chapter because you're going to learn more about the three offices of the living God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit than in any other place in the Word of God. I'm going to read that again. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. Emmanuel, God named him. And what does it mean? God with us. Verse 46. I am come a light unto the world that whosoever, see there's a qualification there. The light is to the world. Whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. You can come into the light. You can come into the truth. You can shed anxiety from your life and, and find peace of mind if you follow him. 47, if you stay in the light, which is to say the word. He is the word. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. I mean, this isn't, the, this isn't the age of judgment. The white throne has not been set in place for that office. For I am come not to judge the world, but to save the world. Meaning, the first advent, he came as savior, for Savior. Um, not a judge. 48. He that rejecteth me, and receiveth not my words, hath one that judgeth him, the word that I have spoken. The same shall judge him in the last day. Now, I think it's important that you hang on to that real good, especially if you consider yourself one of God's election. Christ doesn't judge you. The word judges you. Why? It's written. The question is, do you know? This is one of the major reasons you must remain focused. Not on man, who cares what men think or do. But focus on the word of God, for I tell you this, my friend. It will happen exactly as it's written. And your father is not a trickster. He will not pull something upon you that isn't written in this word, whereby you have ample warning if you have understanding. Well, how do I get understanding? Stay in the light. The light was sent to whosoever, whomsoever. I don't know, you have to answer the question whether you, what category you fit. It's an individual thing. He came not to bring judgment to bring, but to bring that light. Will you receive it? It's for everyone. Verse 49. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. Do you catch the division and yet the oneness? Think. He gave me a commandment that I should, uh, what I should say and what I should speak. Verse 50. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Who, whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Why? It becomes your judge. The word will judge you. Uh, I, I hope you can understand that. You see, there's going to be a time coming when somebody's going to say, uh, well, Father, I didn't know. Why don't you? 
He sent the Word. The Word lived and the Word walked the earth. The Word has been taught upon the earth. What is your excuse? Perhaps you would be one of those that would fit the category of Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 through 10. Who knows? But when you try, you will do well. For Father loves all of his children, especially those that are can-doers, and to try, even if you fall, God considers it a complete, perfect job. All right? when you pray to him. I consider chapter 13 to be written to the elect. If you think, if you close, in a sense, the eyes to the flesh and open your spiritual eyes, you will understand what I'm talking about. 13 chapter, verse 1, and it reads, Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart, I repeat, depart out of this world into the, unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. I mean, he loved them every moment, right up even as he hang on the cross. Verse 2. And supper being ended, I'm sure you all have seen a picture sometime in your life about the Last Supper, all right? And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Satan's bargains drove a hard bargain with old Judas. Judas, you got the money bag there, boy. Hang on to it. Just think. If you can keep this Jesus fool just a little longer and you're one of the 12, you'll be the money banker of the world. The, better than the world, the kingdom of God. Satan can really wrap you good and he loves nothing better than using scripture to do it with as the example is set forth in Matthew chapter 4 when he tempted Christ. Does he tempt you? Be on guard, my friend. Stay focused. Verse 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father was, had given all things and into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, came down from God, he will go back to God. Why? Well, do you not remember verse 45? And he that seeth me seeth him that sent me. Born again, born in his image, looks just like him. Verse 4, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. This is to say he took off his uh, tunic, his top coat, and uh, not his under, under things, but he would gird himself with this towel. This, I want you to see it, is the dress of a slave, not a king. This is the way a slave that was doing work, labor, dressed. So we see the king of kings and lord of lords dressed as a slave. You might learn something from that. Think about it. Talk about an humbling position for the king of kings. Five. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Now, it's good for you to always exercise your mind. Does that sound familiar? Well, it sure does. Well, let's, let's if we may, run back to Isaiah 52, okay? Just hold your place there and let's run back to Isaiah 52 and see if we've heard this before somewhere that might key us in to what's happening here, what could be going on. Verse 6, Isaiah 52, and it reads, Therefore my people shall know my name. What did it say, everybody? No, my people shall know my name. Therefore they shall know in that day that I am he that doth speak. That's to the elect. Behold, it is I. I don't know. 
Where do you fit in that? Seven, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth what? Salvation, not judgment, salvation, that saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. Do you got any doubts about that? If you do, I can tell you this, you live in fear, doubt, and you worry a lot. If you believe that, then those things slide and slip and fall by the wayside. Verse eight, thy watchman, very important, my friend, what category do you fall into? Thy watchman shall lift up the voice, with the voice together shall they sing. For they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. My friend, that's what's happening here. He is the light, he is the way. And he's washing those feet because of that particular scripture. Well, in my mind, I feel most likely. It is a compliment to them that they being the 12 and yet one of them is a traitor, that it is their feet that will carry the message forward after he is crucified and we're facing that Passover at this time. Returning to chapter 13, hold those things in mind for a moment. Verse six, then cometh he to Simon Peter and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? I mean, he felt very uncomfortable having the Savior of the world wash his feet. Seven, Jesus answered and said unto him, what I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. In other words, you don't understand totally right now, but you're going to understand a little after. Okay, verse eight, Peter saith unto him, thou shalt never wash my feet. I mean, you know, Peter was always one that was quick to speak out, snappy. I mean, you know, remember when they would come up to take Jesus, he would draw his sword and lob an ear off of a servant, you know? I mean, he was a man of action. Not me, Lord. Uh, in other words, um, he felt humble before the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're washing someone's feet, you're, you're in a rather humble position, all right? Jesus answered him, if I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Now let that sink in real good. If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. You see, he's much more than the light. Let me ask you something. With whom are your robes washed? Hmm? Is it with the true Christ? Or are you looking for someone else or something else, some other way to work your own salvation out like people did at the Tower of Babel, Babel, Babel? Talk, talk, talk. I don't know. You have to answer that. You know. Make certain that it is in Yeshua Messiah, Jesus the Christ, in which your righteous acts are washed, meaning that it is in the service as a servant or slave to Jesus Christ, whereby your righteous deeds become the very material that makes up your righteous garment that is washed in his blood. And then are you righteous indeed, meaning you are a believer in the light. I don't know, you done any washing lately? Spiritual washing? Verse nine, Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. <laughs> Just bathe me all over, Lord. If it's the feet do that much, I want the whole business. Now that's kind of human-like, all right. 10, Jesus said unto him, he that is washed, bathed, needeth not save to wash his feet, but is 
clean every whit and ye are clean but not all and he looks over at Judas not all in other words there's a devil in their midst there's a demonic spirit in one of them now what has he shown us Times go by and we forget as things were at the time of this writing. What, what type shoes did men wear at this time? Everyone, basically, sandals. What is a sandal? It's open-toed, just a few straps that hold a sole that, uh, and do they walk on clean, scrubbed uh, uh, highways and sidewalks? No, they're old dirt paths. I, w I wonder how many have ever gone barefooted in the summer, which really what sandals lead you down to when you're walking in the dirt and look down at your old feet. Uh, used to, they might say, you wash your hands and your feet, your feet are rusty. And they would look kind of rusty too, you know, when you'd been out in the stuff all day. Well, what are feet for? What are, what are they symbolically and, and, and um, dividing this spiritually, discerning spiritually, rather said, what do the feet do? They carry you. They take the message where you go. But what do they touch? I mean, the message you're carrying is beautiful. It washes the mind, the heart, the soul, it's in the light. But what are you walking upon this earth age? In other words, when you walk in this earth, you're gonna get dirty. There, are, I have never known a person yet, I've, I know one or two, my, bless, my grandmother, bless her heart, that I know come very close to absolutely have been, having been a saint. And, um, but I know what Christ is saying here, you all get dirty walking through this earth age and you're gonna wash, meaning repent, and have your sins cleansed by me, Yeshua Messiah, Jesus the Christ, or you're not gonna be in me. If you don't wash your righteous acts in my blood, there's no other way. You can't build your own salvation. You can't find it outside of the word itself. So for this reason, he would wash their feet to make this point that when you walk in this generation of this earth age, any dispensation of it, <clears throat> any segment, you're gonna get dirty. Do you know why? <clears throat> your flesh. I know flesh. I, I know how flesh thinks. So don't try to con this old boy. And then that won't cause you all the more or should to appreciate him who paid the price by putting on a slave's clothing and washing man's feet, providing for you. So that's all you need. That part that touches this earth age, the rest is clean when you think spiritually and when you do his righteous acts and you're a can-do type person that gets it done, then certainly. But there is one more segment of this you must remember. Was it the actual foot scrubbing that cleansed them? Don't be foolish. For there is one of the 12 and he washed his feet also. But he is a demon, he has a demon. And he's going to betray the Lord Jesus Christ not long hence. So probably you should meditate occasionally. Christ has done his part. Christ accomplished his part for even Judas. He has accomplished his part for you. Now, have you done your part? That's the question, all right? Kind of what he's saying. I wanted to make that real clear. Verse 11, as we continue. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, 
ye are not all clean. So that should let you know he wasn't only talking about dirty feet, all right? He's talking about mind, spirit, soul, 12. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, know ye what I have done to you, question? And I'm sure they're looking back and forth at each other, 13. Ye call me master and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. That's the way it is. And remember, he had just taken the part of the slave, 14. If I then, your Lord and master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. This means, again, think spiritually a moment. Support each other. If somebody's down, ask God's blessing upon them and cheer them up. You know how to do it. Your Christian, your built-in Christian personality simply makes people feel good being around you and it will pick them up. And I don't have to teach you how to support someone. A smile feels so good from a person that means, love, means well and has love in their heart for you. Just a simple smile can just make your day. 15, for I have given you an example, that's all, an example that you should do as I have done to you. It is sad, and I, don't, I know that I offend some when I say this because many people, I get letters, do you do foot washing? No, I don't. Um, because it was only an example of something far richer. I mean, if, hey, if your church does it, fine, no problem, hey, but it's, I hope that if it is done, it is taught as only an example of what actually is, the deeper meaning, the true meaning that washes the very soul itself, okay? Um, but uh, I do not practice that in my ministry, for I would rather, far rather, see people wash their robes in the blood of the Lamb and receive eternal life. 16. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. Note the oneness within that again, beloved, because we'll play this out through the 14th chapter, 17. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. If you uh, hold people up, especially in the church, hold them up. We have some that would tear people down in a church, you know, uh, make uh, different classes. And I'm sorry, I always, I suppose I must always use it, divorce. You know, some, so many churches have this silly habit of making second class citizens out of divorced people, even after they've repented, and Christ has given them a new life. They must still brand and hang on to that sin. There are many others. It's just that that one is so easy to use because there are so very many of the churches that participate within this. The, uh, the old deacons just love to practice their authority and exercise it over the congregation, okay? And, uh, and I know many say, well, that, that, that preacher right there, that teacher is definitely a divorced man. No, I'm not. But I am a teacher of God's Word, and when God forgives someone something, it's gone. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't teach His Word. He is able. So, always use the gathering to pick each other up and draw each other to what? Doesn't do any good to gather together if you're gonna shoot marbles, though there's nothing wrong with shooting marbles, but I hope it's to study the light, which is what? The Word, the true Word in its depth. When Christ would see fit to be your slave, to make this example of how you should be one to the other, Never put a man on a pedestal. We have Christ at the right hand of God, and if you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. And we have His Word as a judge among us. 
There's another way of saying that. You can, and it's called spiritual discernment, quite frankly. You, when you become knowledgeable in the Word, let the Word within you judge what you see as to whether it's correct or not. And that's called spiritual discernment. Now, how possibly could one possess accurate spiritual concern, discernment if they didn't have the Word as the example and witness? They couldn't. Uh, other than the goodness of their heart, it's better to be accurate, precise. For God's Word, you talk about high tech, hey, it's precision. It's right on. You will never find anything more accurate than our Father. He knows exactly what He's doing. He accomplished this for you. What you do with it, well, then that's what you will live with. What you do with it, that's what you will sleep with. He wants you to stay in that brilliant light that is His truth. Do you, do you understand what that example within itself, it's so obvious sometimes though, I really believe people overlook the real meaning. When it's really, when you really think you're so good that you can get out into the dim edges, you know. Let me ask you a question. Do you see as well in the dark? Are you a cat? Or if you are loaded and locked in your mind with the word by which you discern with, then you are under the brightness of God himself whereby you have clarity and perfect sight to see and to understand his word. Do not let someone that has a physical handicap be offended by that because some of you see far better than some people I know that have 20-20. I'm speaking spiritually. So cleanse yourself and bask in that beautiful light of truth. It's so reassuring. It's so comforting. It gives you strength, power, health, success. The light is with you. The light is with all of us. And through the 14th chapter, we're going to learn a great deal more about that light. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment.